Welcome to an evening at the Quill and Tankard with the hosts of Maester Monthly, the moderators of the Song of Ice and Fire subreddit. As a warning, this episode will be spoilers extended, which means that we can talk about anything from the Winds of Winter, from Game of Thrones episodes. It's all fair game. So if you're spoiler reverse, leave now or forever hold your peace. (laughs) My name is Michael also known as Bookshelf Stud. And my name is Eliana, also known as Glass Table Girl. And my name is Matt, also known as Joe Magician. And I'm Jeff. I am better known as Brenna B. Fish. And I'm just a guest here. So I'm here to like chill and talk about some Alisane, bitches. Let's talk about Alisane forever and ever. You're not a guest, Jeff. This is I'm not an archmaester. I'm not. I'm just a regular maester. I'm. I'm. I'm more of a. I consider myself more of a uh, <laughs> Leo Tyrell, like a crescent. <laughs> no, no, not a Leo Tyrell. I'm a little bit advanced about Leo Tyrell. Come on now. I, I'm more of. I'm more of a crescent as opposed to like I'm. You get you guys is Marwin essentially. Why am I not surprised you chose Stannis as maester as the maester you would be? <laughs> True that. He's the best maester. He's great. So there has been an exciting recent development, which is why we're all gathered here today, dearly beloved. Um, Fire and Blood is coming out in November, and George has released an excerpt from Fire and Blood that has not been published anywhere else yet. Um, There's obviously been some stuff that's come out, like Aegon's Conquest was featured in the World of Ice and Fire. Um, Sons of the Dragon was in the Book of Swords. Um, But this is kind of the first real thing that stands on its own. And this is an excerpt that was all about what we thought it would be all about um, King Jaehaerys, right? But it's actually about Queen Alysanne. I didn't think that. You didn't think that? For the record. I knew. I was like, because Sons of the Dragon, again, Uh was actually about Visenya and all the other women surrounding Megor, etc. I knew. You knew. You knew this was a, this was a fun excerpt. I mean, this was there was a lot of yeah. cool stuff in here. We're going to talk about all of it, but let's get started before we dive into it head first. Where, if you were Alisan <laughs> and you were flying around doing a royal tour on Dragonback on Silverwing, is that her dragon? Yes, name? That's Silverwing. Silverwing. Yep. Silverwing. Um, Silverwing. If you were on Silver, <laughs> is that a song? Is this a song I don't Silverwing. know? Silverwing. Oh no, Silverwing. it's not. Else. <laughs> It's just doing time Christmas in right. White in Arbor. Or White Arbor, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hear them ring. <laughs> Ding a ling. Um, so if you were on Silverwing, where in the north would you go if you were if you were doing sort of Alisan's tour? Or if you were just flying around, I guess, if you're just having a good time. Just keep okay. it in the north, of course, because this is a royal progress to the north. So you can't go visit the Sands of Dorne or whatever. Uh, not Dorne. That's where I always want to go with all the sand. It's so lovely. <laughs> where I would go is I would go to the Dreadfort and burn those fuckers to the ground. They have it coming. They know what they did. Screw you, Boltons. No <laughs> man for the crimes they do, not for the crimes they might commit one day. They have a room full of skins. They've committed crimes. They got to go. But what's interesting about this chapter is that is there a single mention of House Bolton or a single Lord of the Dreadfort in this chapter? Or no, because she burned rather? them all down. That's why. Mm, oh, yeah, I know you report. About that. <laughs> <laughs> I do believe that George has said we will see a lot of the Boltons or some of the Boltons in Fire and Blood. Yeah, he does. Um, but it, they, they, do not, they do not pop up in this chapter. Presumably because, like you said, Alisanne just sort of torched them by accident. Mm-hmm. Um, she pulled a Joe magician. <laughs> this is like every 50 years, you just got to burn the dread fort and everybody in it to the ground. It's fine. It's normal. Get over it. It's like a forest fire. You have to burn it all down for the good to mm-hmm. sprout once more. Hmm. Hmm. Really putting the dread in dread fort. <laughs> That's not that funny. <laughs> it's good. good it was a good try though, man. I appreciate it. Thank you. Eliana, what about you? Where would you go if you were flying around on Silverwing? Ding-a-ling. <laughs> um, just because I don't want to say anything that was in this chapter, because I guess we've kind of seen these places before, I would probably say 
in thematically keeping with this chapter, Bear Island. Ooh. Yeah, I mean, there is a, a mention of a Mormont. Yeah. I think that... Oh, wait, we're not role-playing as Alisan, are we? We're just go- saying be. where we are going in with the dragon. Well, I mean, if I were Alisan, I think that I would personally, for funsies, want to go see Bear Island because I think she would find a lot of like-minded women or even like women who aren't like-minded but who are willing to regard her as an intellectual equal. And it'd be great and fun. Yeah, especially after uh, what what's, Alaric tells her about his Mormont wife, who he loved so much, right? Yeah, and then you yeah. could like meet up with maybe her sisters and be like, "Oh my God, do you know what your brother-in-law did when I went over there?" And that's what it would be like. <laughs> they never do family reunions at Winterfell anymore. <laughs> I gotta say, I didn't think it was going the path of show up to Bear Island to uh, gossip about Winterfell, but fair. <laughs> I, I thought you were going to go like, oh, we're getting to some sweet wrestling matches as is tradition on Bear Island. Uh, ¿Por qué no los dos? Matt. What? <laughs> What'd you just say to me? I, I don't speak Italian, so I don't know what yeah. that meant. Yeah, really, what did you say? I said, well, why not both? Yeah. Oh, yeah. ¿Por qué no los dos? Yeah. Oh, like that GIF. Oh, yeah. <laughs> GIF. G- Wait, which one? Oh do yes, I, like? I guess the 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 gif, the new gif mm-hmm. <laughs> that Allison. The, the, the gif by Ned Stark, yeah. Wrong, Jeff. Where where would you fly if you had a dragon, Silverwing or otherwise? I the the North kind of sucks as a place to like fly to, right? I mean, where where are you going to actually fly to? Like, you can go to Bear Island to gossip with the Mormont ladies. You can go to Winterfell, but you can get a Winterfell on a horse, right? You can go to White Harbor, but of course, like Alisane arrives in White Harbor with her entourage, you know, with but on ships, right? Besides herself, who's who's flying on a dragon. So I, I guess I would choose the Alisane route, and I would go to the Wall. The parts of the Wall, I think, would go with the Night Fork. Could that be because that would be cool? Um, I don't know. I, I, I always like it, it's never featured in the books, but the Shadow Tower always strikes me as like a fucking badass like name. And so of course, the badass name has to have a badass location behind it right so i'll go to the shadow tower i think if i was flying you know silver wing on silver wing on a on on dragon back so that, that's where i would go the shadow tower i think i mean yeah you've got the what is it the gorge of skulls right bridge is of skulls the, bridge of the skulls gorge. yeah yeah whatever is the shadow tower part of like the shadow realm where like all the villains from Yu-Gi-Oh get sent to Ooh, <laughs> this is what i want to talk about don't understand these so references. do you think the night king is basically bakora i think bakora <laughs> so, is yeah. more humanized <laughs> and like more sympathetic maybe i don't know okay anyway anyway so you so, <laughs> Fucking Bakura voice. Um, Great Bakura voice. Thank you so much. Um, for the record, if I were on Dragonback flying around the North, I I don't know. Yeah, it is kind of a hard question because the North does suck. But um, I would probably try to visit like the least hospitable places, like maybe go visit the Mountain Clans or Skagos or something. Some place that like is kind of a pain in the ass to get to on foot um, or or even on horseback. And I mean, the, the mountain clansmen seem pretty tight. Uh, it sounds like they, you know, they party hard. Um, they probably make moonshine or something. I mean, I, I bet that's pretty cool. Um, so I could actually, I could get some dinner in Skagos and then have some after dinner drinks with the moonshine making hill folk of the, of the West Coast. That would fit you living in Virginia. Nowhere Virginia, really. <laughs> To like be out there with like the moonshine folk, like making like a bathtub whiskey out there. Yeah, like I, oh, I see that. The I whiskey, see. yeah. There you go. Yeah, like, like they have like acorn whiskey or something that they just. <laughs> no, they ironically have Knob Creek. Out. It's like what? How's this guy here? <laughs> I'll have you know that my drink of choice tonight is actually Old Crow, um, medicine. Which, well, well, no, just Old Crow whiskey. Oh, okay, um, fine. Which, but you know, like the Night's Watch, like the. Like the crows, or even like the very, very, very old crow that we have in the story, Blood Raven, who is the three-eyed crow and real old. 
And he's kind of a medicine man when you think about it. And he's puts on a show for Bran. So it is an old crow medicine show. There it is. <laughs> Got there. Wow. Going to circle. Danny's going to break the wagon. Oh my God. <laughs> yes. Wait, wait, wait. So, so wrong. So, if, so it's, wrong. if it's Blood Raven whiskey, are you implying that you shoved them into a uh, a barrel of, of liquor like Eamon? <laughs> right. Yeah. Just, yeah, yeah. Just like Eamon. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, okay. it's just putrefied uh, Blood Raven, putrefied Brendan Rivers. Good podcast, guys. Really good. <laughs> good podcast. We're off to a great start. Good content. Oh, this yeah, is we what actually, the people want. We actually talk about like the story at some point, don't we? <laughs> That's a great Maybe. point. So speaking of the story, um, let's go through and do a little summary, and we can sort of pass it back and forth um, through the summary. So I'll hand it off to someone after I read a little bit of it. But um, for those of you who haven't read the excerpt, um, because I know it's very long, it's over a thousand words, I think. So that's, <laughs> it's pretty crazy. Um, no, but if, if you haven't, if you haven't read it, um, or even if you have and you've forgotten immediately, <laughs> um, basically what happens in the chapter, we open. Jaharis and Alisan plan to go to Winterfell, but some free cities hijinks occur. Jaharis has to stay home. Alisan goes on ahead, and the free cities hijinked Pentos and Tyrosh are locked in an Israel-Palestine conflict and request Jaharis to uh, conciliate the process and guarantee that all treaty terms are signed, all that kind of stuff. Basically, the Camp David Accords, I think. Uh, I wasn't born then, so I don't know. Um, Alisan heads for the north for White Harbor, where she encounters Theobald Manderley, um, which is a fun name. Uh, tons of people turn out for a party, um, and there's some Manderley backstory, a little bit about White Harbor. Theobald is surprised that this many people came to his party. Um, and while in White Harbor, she does some interesting stuff, and I'm going to throw the hat to Eliana. Alisan does a lot in White Harbor. For example, she does a lot to bind the realm together and seal alliances by arranging marriages which seals the north to the rest of the realm, but especially with House Manderley, because at, we haven't gotten confirmation yet about any marriages she was able to ally with the Starks. Maybe, maybe. And there's also a tourney that definitely has some shades of other stories that we hear in A Song of Ice and Fire, where there is a girl who masquerades as a knight fighting. Turns out she's a wildling girl. And Alisan's like, oh, wait, have you met one of my sworn swords? The Scarlet Shadow, a.k.a. Jonquil Drake. Uh, not Drake, sorry, Dark. Um, <laughs> Drake. <laughs> now I want to see Drake. this. Drake turned into <laughs> Alisane's sworn uh, Alisane, do you love me? <laughs> Dude, I, don't trust, I don't trust Drake around that small wilding girl. True. All right. Would it be White Harbor Bling? Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. And then she also sends her party sailing the White Knife uh, to go to Winterfell while she decides to go fly her dragon. And she's been warned by the Amor Manderley about the situation there, but another really interesting thing that Alisan does while she's at uh, the Manderleys is that she holds a sort of like town hall meeting, which that is solely for the women, yeah, and the girls of the realm. It is there too, apparently unheard of in the north, which kind of makes me wonder if it's unheard of in the north, is it something that would happen sometimes in the south? Ooh. I don't think so. It, it feels like like a listening tour. And if you guys remember from like, and I, I, maybe I'm dating myself, but I remember like in 2008. Um, I wasn't even born. I know, <laughs> right? <laughs> so fucking childish. Um, but like in like 2008, like Obama and McCain both held quote unquote listening tours where they would go around to different places and be like, citizen tell me your concerns you <laughs> citizen me king or queen in this case let me know what's going on with you and in, in your life and how i can appeal to you as as a citizen so i think like it's a really cool way that alisan attempts to expand targaryen power by having people have a stake in it right because i mean like that's that's the thing right it's it's made clear that it's 200 women who are coming to alisan at white harbor and it's a mixture of nobles, 
and also small folk too. So you have a mixture of different perspectives that are bringing their ideas and their concerns to Alisane. And, you know, I, I do wonder, like, it, it's brought up, and I believe it's in A Dance with Dragons, that Jahara's banned um, the Rite of the First Night, the, yeah. the Rite of the First Night um, in, in the North. And I do wonder whether this stemmed from that, um, where the women are mm -hmm. like, look, like all these, I, I'm a small folk woman. I, I marry my husband. I love him dearly. But the Lord, but Lord Umber says that is, he has the right of the first night and he, he gets the, the first, you know, how do I say this politely? He gets the first crack at me. That's not polite. <laughs> that That's was polite. polite. <laughs> yeah, I mean. Mel Gibson couldn't defend me. <laughs> and, and I, and I do wonder whether that, that was something that was discussed here at this, um, this council session mm -hmm. and whether that resulted from the the uh the outlawing of the right of the first night by the uh, nobility and the noble class in westeros it certainly seems so we see the name alisane show up in the north a lot after this and she's known as good queen ally throughout the north so she did something for them she did something uh they also there's also a queen's crown which was named after her and uh she gave them snowgate so it appears that she went around the north on an extended listening tour plus this one and made a lot of changes that people were asking for, I guess. Yes, but we're getting ahead of ourselves here. Yes, we are. Sorry. Um, Sorry. So a question I have about this court though, while we're throwing out things, okay, is like, especially if we're talking about the grievances of the right of the first night, I wonder to what extent this town hall meeting was open to the small folk. It might've been based on the party that was held for her uh, by the Manderleys, but was it open to lowborn people or was it only open to highborn or higher born women? And from where did they come from? Like you can't have people coming from like too far away. Cause like nobody got Amtrak. Right. Well, so the, thing, the thing that's made clear in this chapter is that the small folk have swallowed in numbers at white Harbor where they've come to see Alisane or have come for another reason. I think the primary reason is they want to either see a dragon or to see their queen, right? Because what was the last Targaryen that's been north of the north of the neck? It was Aegon the First, as far as we know. Of course, fire and blood might bring something else to the fore that we don't know of. But this is the first time the Targaryens have been to White Harbor, as far as we know, right? And correct me if I'm wrong. I, I don't remember off the top of my head, but it could be nobility, but it could also be that swelling of of, of small folk in White Harbor that you know, presented this opportunity for Alison to hear the perspective of different classes, whether that's the lowborn, the middle class, the merchant types, or the nobility as well, because it, it could be a variety of folks who are interacting with Alison at this this um, this council of 200 women at, at White Harbor. Which in retrospect makes White Harbor a completely strategic choice to hold this, because as you said, if it's all of these people of different classes, including the merchant types, and because of where it's located, it provides a lot of transportation for people to all come and see her and be able to air their grievances, which I'm just going to put that on Alison and be like, masterful move, girl. It was really good. And uh, White Harbor is basically the only real city in the north. So, yeah. yeah, it works perfectly. All the other towns and cities that we know of in the north are basically just keeps with small villages outside. White Harbor is the only one, only one that resembles the south in any way. And, you know, White Harbor also has vassal lords, too. That's something that we don't see in the rest of the North. You know, the the Glovers have, like, the Foresters from the Telltale Gable, from the Telltale game. R.I.P. Yeah, rip. <laughs> and, um, but the, but the, the Manderleys have folks like the Flints, and they have the folks, um, uh, what is the actual name of the, the other, the other house that's sworn to them that holds the, the uh, castle, Old Castle? I don't know. The locks, the locks, the locks. So don't the lock forget House Woolfield. Yes, Woolfield, Locks, <laughs> Flints. So the Manorleys have a variety of different noble houses that are surrounding White Harbor that have the ability to come and treat with 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 Wyman Manorley, and that's a very southern type um, custom because you know in, in the South you have folks that are sworn to houses that are sworn to houses. You know, you have in in Old Town you have various houses like the Beesburys who are sworn to um, to the high towers and the high towers are sworn to the Tyrells. Well, in this case you have where you have folks like the locks or 
you know, the Flint's sworn to Manderly, who are sworn to Stark, who are sworn to the Targaryens. So it, it's a really interesting dynamic that we have going on here. We have four, um, four different four different lines of power that are removed from Alysanne, but still they're being heard by the Queen of Westeros. And I think that's a really cool point that speaks to Alysanne's character, particularly. It's like a president meeting with like a city councilor. Like it's, it's, you know, yeah, it, it, it's several steps down the sort of hierarchy of, of the government of Westeros, basically. Um, yeah, it's, yeah, it's a very interesting moment. Um, she doesn't stop at White Harbor, of course, Alysanne. Um, she does continue on to Winterfell to meet Alaric Stark, Lord Alaric, um, who's basically Stannis. Um, yeah. You know, he, he sounds almost exactly uh, like Stannis. Yes. Um, and she's warned about him, like uh, the Amor Manderly gives her a heads up. So she flies ahead on Dragonback, and Alaric just immediately um, starts throwing shade, despite the fact that she's on Dragonback. He's like, oh, you you should have dressed more warmly. Um, yeah, he's a he's a real dick about this. Yeah, <laughs> he, and he, he, he makes nobody... a crack. Oh, sorry, go ahead. He makes a crack about Heron Hall. He's like, oh, yeah. I've never been to Heron Hall, but I, I heard what I heard what you people did there. Um, he's also like, leave Silverwing outside, which, yeah. as we're readers, you can sort of connect that to what happened with Rob Stark and Walder Frey, where it's like, last time we saw this happen, it didn't go well. Yeah. I trust uh, no one who tells me to leave my dog at home. Right, exactly. exactly. I, I just want to emphasis, emphasize this, is that Alysanne arrives to Winterfell on Dragonback, and Alaric Stark decides to start throwing shade to a woman who, again, is on fucking Dragonback. Like, that is <laughs> insane. Like, He's crazy. Imagine? Like, she has the ability to roast this dude right there in the courtyard of Winterfell. You have to assume that it, this is happening there. Yeah. But she doesn't, because she's awesome. And uh, but still, at the same time, does speak to Alaric's courage. Maybe I don't. I don't, I don't know. It's it's kind of a interesting dynamic that we have going on here between the Starks and the Targaryens. And this is something I, I kind of want to emphasize: is that I I, I like the world of ice and fire plenty, good enough. But <laughs> <laughs> right. But here, I think like George like really gets a great well to develop the story and. The reason why he gets this well to develop, to develop the story is because he's in the North. He's not in King's Landing. He's in a place where people have diametrically opposed ideals and different ideologies that are going into this confrontation between Alaric and Alysanne. And I think that's a really great moment that George decides to develop in the story. I think that's fantastic. And, you know, we we have so many, like, we have Alaric throwing shade again to Alysanne, who is on, again, I have to emphasize this, she's on <laughs> fucking dragon back dude like yeah. it's it's incredibly courageous on his part but at the same time like alisane's not like aegon or like a or, or like a mago or like just like kill these people with dragon fire she actually listens to him right yeah i mean it you compare it to like uh i don't remember the name of the ruler of the veil when Visenya landed on her dragon oh but yeah. who surrendered the entire veil immediately upon like having a queen land in his backyard on a dragon it was like, oh, it's all yours now. No, no, no. Oh, no, no wait, 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 wait. Visenya. Yeah. Is it Rainey's? No, no. Visenya was holding. So it was a woman, I believe, who was in charge of the veil. Yeah. yeah. Also, and Visenya was holding that woman's son. And they were like, and they sorted it out as women, all peacefully. I'm like, mm, that's because Visenya had her son. Well, but, yeah, but that's that, you, that's what I mean, though. Like, the, it's not like the the lady in charge of the veil, and I I don't remember any of their names. It's not like she was like, "Excuse me, you can't park your dragon here." Well, <laughs> like, part, well, part <laughs> of the rationale does do that. You can't do this. Part part of the rationale is that Visenya took that Aaron child on a dragon ride before he yeah. before she yeah. treated with the the lady region of the veil at that point. So it's it's a very interesting dynamic that we have going on here where you know Visenya has an implied threat when she goes to the veil mm -hmm. but uh, but you know Alysanne she she treats with Alaric almost as a co-equal maybe not as a co-equal but it, it, in terms of like not with the, with an implied threat even though that she has the dragon there as an implied threat but she doesn't like be like I if you don't listen to what I say I will burn this castle and burn you and your heirs to the ground yeah. like she like Aegon the first does at Harrenhal I just yeah. want to say that by the end of their encounter, Alaric is also trying to 
Get a dragon ride. If you know what I'm saying. Oh. Woo, high five. Hell yeah. Uh, that's right. I, I think that's right on, Jeff. And it, it's the dynamics of what's going on is not just Alaric comes out to meet her. She He comes out with all of his sons and then mentions Harrenhal. So he's daring her to try and do with how the Targaryens have normally dealt with kings and lords in the past. Alicent doesn't take the bait and instead turns it back on him with a um, with her charm. And yeah, like you said, like treating him like an equal, sort of yeah. putting putting him at the place where like, this is your, I will leave Silverwing outside. This is your hall. We're here to talk. I'm not here to dictate, which is not normally how the Targaryens have done things in the past. Yeah. And, you know, there, you, you start to see why George and, you know, the books reflect that Alysanne and Jaehaerys, by extension, in, the, in this case, are really the best Targaryen rulers because she charms this dude. She goes on a charm offensive, if to use another, like, political term, yeah. here to, to be like, you know, I, I can use my dragon, but I'm not going to use my dragon here to enforce my will. I'm going to utilize my ability of political persuasion to bring you to my side in order to convince you that the Targaryens are the best choice for you. You know, I, and, and I put this note, in, I put this note in our notes that I did wonder whether the journey to Winterfell was because there was a potential for more Stark desires for independence, because as we all know, mm -hmm. Torrent Stark bent the knee and it's possible that, you know, you have these folks who might've been like, we can resist the Targaryens. We can resume our independence again. But Alysanne comes up there, and instead of bringing fire and blood to the Starks at Winterfell, she brings the power of persuasion there. And I think it's a fantastic and wonderful note that George is setting here that really kind of undercut the not undercut, not undercuts, but but really uh, but really serves as foundation for the the relationship that develops between Alysanne and Alaric Stark in this chapter or excerpt rather. I think that it was necessary for Alysanne to make that trip because, as you said, I think that the North might have been considering to concede to not to secede, as you mentioned, because yeah. as we learn in Sons of the Dargan, after even towards like the later half of or late like late end of Aegon the Conqueror's rule, people were questioning this Targaryen rule, right, and then. Aenys was a weak ruler and people at that point were starting to think like, oh, we can take him. We don't need to stay here. And so in retaliation after Aenys died, Megor was like iron fists, like too much like stamping really hard down. And then Megor was gone. But like they seeing the way that Megor treated the, the rest of Westeros and Westeros in general, there is an absolute need to foster that goodwill again with the rest of the realm. Very right. true. And, and you know, like Magor had suffered multiple rebellions against his rule, whether it's the Faith Milton uprising or the Ultimate Rebellion, which is Jaehaerys' rebellion, which ends up dispatching Magor, whether it's by he was murdered or whether he committed suicide on the Iron Throne. It, it's it, it's clear that the Targaryen rule on Westeros was particularly weak at this juncture when Jaehaerys assumes the throne. And you can see you know, the chapter starts with the king had not made it had not made a, a progress in, in several years. And it seems to me that progresses in Westeros are intended to solidify the rule of the current claimant to the Iron Throne, the current person who is sitting the Iron Throne. So we get the sense that Jaehaerys and Alysanne's rule might not have been as secure as might have been hoped. And having and journeying north to the and, and journey north of the neck and onto White Harbor and Winterfell helped to solidify the rule that the Targaryens were hoping to establish in Westeros. Absolutely, yeah. And I mean, Alaric clearly takes a shine to Alysanne. Like she does a really good job here. Um, the the quote from the excerpt is, you know, once the initial frost had thawed, his lordship took the queen hunting after elk and wild boar in the wolf's wood, showed her the bones of a giant and allowed her to rummage as she pleased through his modest castle library. He even deigned to approach Silverwing, though warily. Um, and there's, I mean, there's some interesting stuff there. I, the mention of the castle library, I mean, later Tyrion thinks that Winterfell's library is incredibly well stacked, and here it's described as modest. So did Alysanne, like, send him a bunch of books or something afterward? You know, like... Or Barth. Um, or Barth, yeah. Um, By the way, that's like the best date. <laughs> it's like, 
So we're going to go boar hunting. I'm going to show you some bones of a giant. It's going to be real cool. They're going to rummage through the library. You in? Yeah, mm. I'm in. Just like Honestly. the most romantic thing. Yeah. Although I usually, I mean, I, I feel like he should probably save the showing the bones for last, but maybe. Hey, yeah. sometimes you got to show the bones second. That's, yeah, that's right. Um, second date kind of guy. Um, anyway, we do get this funny sort of interlude in the middle of the excerpt. Um, where So there's a meanwhile back in King's Landing. Um, and Jaharis is not having the same amount of fun Alisan is having. Uh, he is unable to conciliate between Pentos and... And Tyrosh, and they are actually starting to like have gang fights in the streets and like murder each other in taverns. Um, it's it's falling apart completely for Jaharis. Uh, but of course, Alisan's having a great time, and she is bored, even despite the bones of the giant, and decides to go to the wall for a little bit. Um, there's this interesting passage where the Alaric Stark has to warn the guys at the wall to keep the former poor fellows and warriors sons who were part of the faith militant uprising that fought the Targaryens to keep those guys who are now black brothers of the night's watch away from her. Um, so she flies to the wall on Silverwing. Um, Alicent's first sight of the wall takes her breath away. <laughs> Is this a, th there's a, a musical note in the in the document. Take my here. breath away. There we go. Wow, listeners, you just got to see like Top Gun. Oh, with have Berlin. I seen Top Gun? Yeah, yeah I, I've seen it like a dozen times. You know, ten of those times being, you know, when I was the the wee age of twenty seven. But you know, <laughs> I, I I do think uh, like yeah, it, it, it's the wall like really has a. It has to like a symbolic importance to Alisane, but it also has just a kind of like seeing the Statue of Liberty for the first time in your entire life. Or this is a terrible metaphor, te not terrible metaphor, but a terrible saying. But when I was when I was a kid, seeing the Twin Towers for this time for the first time, or the Empire State Building, like it has that moment where you're like, "Wow, how can something this large be built? And how can I uh, uh, be built by men? And how?" you know how do i evaluate this as, as a as a person as an individual yeah definitely it's it's one of the wonders of the world right um and even for someone on dragon back in fact i'm i'm sure it looks even cooler from the air because from the air everything's so small except the wall um <laughs> the wall's still huge it's like 700 feet tall is that right um yep yeah so alisan visits with um lord commander burley which is, which is a great name um, Lord Commander Burley, who has dinner, you know, he he sends away a bunch of the riffraff, but he still has 800 of the finest Night's Watchmen to have dinner with Alisan, which is a little depressing, um, given the current state of the Night's Watch, where like 800 men would absolutely make the difference. And the this excerpt, not the whole chapter, obviously, the chapter must keep going, but this excerpt ends on an interesting note. And I'm just going to read the quote from the end of the excerpt from the last passage here. Um, Silver Wing does not like this wall. Though it was summer and the wall was weeping, the chill of the ice could still be felt whenever the wind blew and every gust would make the dragon hiss and snap. Thrice I flew Silver Wing high above Castle Black and thrice I tried to take her north beyond the wall, Alisan wrote to Jaharis, but every time she veered back south again and refused to go. Never before has she refused to take me where I needed to go. I laughed about it when I came down again, so the Black Brothers would not realize anything was amiss, but it troubled me then, and it troubles me still. That is a quote. That Woo. Different parts of the short story have lit different parts of the fandom on fire, and this one took like the, the fantasy, the like symbolism, the people that really like the magic side of the of a song of ice and fire and like threads erupted talking about this that not only does the wall seemingly stop the others it stops dragons and it stops dragons from the south it's not it's not one way it's two ways and it's 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 hard to make of what it exactly means but it's one of those few times where we're getting another 
peek behind the curtain from George about what's going on in his magical world. Uh, yeah, I, I, it's, I, I can talk, tell you from my, from my, uh, my mentions on Twitter that a lot of folks have talked about like, well, does this mean that dragons can't cross the wall or does it mean like they can cross like the Bay of Seals or they can go around the wall from the Western side? It, it, it's an open question, really. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's, it's very cool. I think it's, it's a development that makes a lot of sense in my opinion, um, with the wall being basically this sort of just magical blockade. Um, but right. it's, it's significant. It's, it's a very significant thing. And yeah, I mean, it, it opens all these questions about, okay, so what is allowed to pass and what isn't Melisandre is allowed to pass and she's a, you know, magical person. Um, and she crosses to and fro pretty easily and without any of, real difficulty. She gets strong. Direwolves too. That's right. The direwolves are able to cross as well. Um, but John loses contact with Ghost when the wall's between them. His warging stops. But he can still see werewolf visions from across the wall too. It's very strange, the rules right. of this wall. <laughs> uh, one thing that I think really blew people's minds, oh, blew mine in particular, was that I think... There's there's a lot of emphasis on fire magic versus ice magic, and there's a delineation between them that they're separate, that they do different things. But if the wall blocks dragons and the others, then they're not as separate as we think. They're really working from the same core somewhere in the story, which is a yeah. revelation really in understanding what's happening between them. It's only a revelation if you're a ding dong who doesn't understand the books. No, I'm just kidding. Wow. It's, uh, it's a revelation. Wow. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah, that was really aggressive. Um, no, but yeah, I mean, there, there's been debates going back and forth in the fandom for a long time about like, well, is it different elemental types of magic or is it all one thing that just manifests differently? And this seems to lean towards the second where it's it's all one magic that, you know, just happens to take different forms sometimes. Or the other possibility is that when they built the wall, they were like programming what can't go through. If you think of it like a computer and dragons were one of the ones included, which means not only dragons were around back then, but they were a problem and that it's also stopping them from going into the other's territory, which might suggest that the creation of the wall was more mutual than prison like. So a question that I have is why is the assumption that like, Silverwing refuses to 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 cross the wall or go beyond it because of the wall itself and not the idea that Silverwing is intimidated by whatever lies beyond the wall. Like as an animal, you know, animals are able to sense sometimes like threats. They can smell things. I don't know, she's high up in the air. She's an enormous lizard. She can probably smell things and won't go north because because she can sense whatever possible threat exists. I think that's a really valid point. Yeah. Um, especially, I mean, it's not described as Silverwing ran into a barrier and, you know, like Silverwing bumped her nose in midair and was like, nope, can't do that. You know, it's, it is, she refuses to go north. So Although we do see her. we see the same behavior from cold hands where he doesn't actually bounce off the wall, but he does refuse to go through it. And we're not I'm not I, I don't think we really know what's making them feel that way, but it appears from both sides we have two magical things coming to the wall and saying no and going back. It could be sensing like Eliana saying, but it could be uh, something else going on that we don't quite understand yet. Por que no los dos? I think we have our unofficial episode title there. <laughs> <laughs> I've also seen arguments that it's that Silverwing doesn't want to go north of the wall because of the the threat of the others pose. But I, I'm also I, I'm hesitant to embrace that argument because I don't think that the White Walkers were walking. Eh, whatever, oh, we're walking at that point in the story. I think that was a more recent development, or else we would have seen some sort of mass migration of the wildlings south of the wall, you know, 200 years before events, 250 years before the events of the, of the main story. But I, I don't know. I, I feel like it's, it's, it's such a interesting question as to why civil wing is, is so reticent about going north of the wall. It's because it's worried against magical beings. 
maybe, but again, like we talked about, the direwolves come south of the wall. You know, in in John in one of John's chapters in the Game of Thrones, the Whites are able to make it south of the wall, still in a dead status, but they you know return to some sort of white status uh, at, at some point and attempt to kill Lord Commander Jorah Mor Gior Mormont in, in in a Game of Thrones. The whites mess up every theory. <laughs> it, n nothing really accounts for how they can do that through the wall. It, yeah, I don't think anybody's cracked it yet. Although for one reason for why the dragons might not be able to make it through is it's implied in the world of ice and fire that the dragons were not natural, that they were made, that the Valyrians used blood magic and like weird like breeding techniques in order to make them. So maybe that makes them different and closer to the others. And the dire wolves, where the dire wolves seem to be naturally occurring. So maybe there's something there, but I don't really know. Well, there's there is a lot to talk about with this, and I want to. We can come back to the wall, but there's some other stuff I think to discuss about it, including kind of the meta side, which I think we always like to get into a little bit. <laughs> um, you know, why this excerpt? When was this written? All those kind of questions. Um, I don't really have any sense of when this thing was written. Um, but maybe someone else can, you know, jump in and, and help me out here. Yeah. So we know from the world of ice and fire that the extract that Elio Garcia Jr. and Lynn and Linda Antonson received was pretty bare bones. It wasn't particularly that fleshed out. So one of the things that Elio Garcia had said is that he spoke with George R. R. Martin at Worldcon 2017, not this past one that that occurred a few weeks ago in which George had told him that, um, that he had really fleshed out Jaehaerys the first Targaryen in uh, post the world of ice and fire. So you get the sense that perhaps this excerpt was written in the, like the 2017, 2018 timeframe. So it's pretty recent. If, if we consider, if we, if we take, Elio at his word, which which I do, and that it was really written, you know, within the past like year or so. So I think that's like kind of interesting because it shows us where George's mind is in writing a song of ice and fire at, at that juncture, and and in a relative recent juncture as opposed to some of the stuff from the world of ice and fire, which was written like the 2012 to the 2013 time frame. That's a good point, and it also, I mean, the that Elio quote does show that he has been. It, this these aren't just his notes that he wrote for the world of ice and fire and then sat on for six years or something like he has been actually working on these and writing them and writing new content for fire and blood um at the very least fleshing out bare bones content that he had um so that's a good thing in the sense it means fire and blood is probably gonna be pretty good in the sense that he's been working on it a lot it's a bad thing in the sense that he has not just been working on the Winds of Winter. He's also been plowing ahead on, you know, Jahari's excerpts and, and other projects that have to do with fire and blood. It, I think it also indicates that uh, one other thing George has been doing is he's been watching the last few seasons of Game of Thrones. Oh. Because <laughs> <laughs> a lot of these characters and a lot of the ways they're acting bear striking resemblances to characters that have died recently in Game of Thrones or characters that have done things that George maybe disapproves of. Yeah. Um, I mean, we just spent a lot of time talking about how a dragon will not cross the wall. Yeah. Didn't that happen in the show? Like three of them did or something? <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, a couple of them. Yeah. A handful of them. And there's also a line in this about how Alisane went from Winterfell to the wall, but it was too long for one trip, so she had to stop overnight. And raising the implausibility of, let's say, jetting from Dragonstone to beyond the wall in like just a few hours. Hmm. It's, so I'm actually mostly curious about Matt's perception, because Matt, you have the reputation of being the defender of Game of Thrones <laughs> on the Maester Monthly podcast. Yeah. Is that your reputation? Is that my reputation? Is that well, what you're known like for? Social media, I, I, I would say, is that that Matt is much more of a uh, the dude that's you know you you would call if you wanted to like defend Game of Thrones from a book perspective. So, Matt, okay. what's your take? On <laughs> when there's Game of Thrones haters in your neighborhood, call Matt. Oh. <laughs> Yo, magician. <laughs> that's gonna that's gonna be a video now. Um, yeah. 
So which part do you want me to respond to, Jeff? <laughs> oh, the whatever, insults, whatever all of the insults he just hurled at you? <laughs> Why is it an insult? To defend the yourself. <laughs> well, I, I, let's 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 go with um just to narrow it. Let's go with Daenerys's three dragons crossing through the wall because I think that's a major point. I mean, you, you can make like the argument that well, Daenerys's dragons are much more OP and they can like fly much more quickly and stuff like that. But the wall being a barrier to the dragons flying north of the wall seems like a very direct response, maybe not direct, but indirect response to what happens in Game of Thrones season seven. Sure. So uh, what I would say to that is this is the first time it's ever been hinted that a dragon cannot go through the wall at all. In fact, there's been talk of ice dragons. There have been fossils of dragons found in the north. So this is liter today is the first time anyone has found out that that's a thing. So if Dan and Dave did a bad thing by including that, I mean, George, maybe you could have uh, let them know about that one or gotten this out a little bit sooner, perhaps. Because you can't really blame them for not knowing something that literally nobody knows except apparently George. That would be my response to that. No, it's good. I, I, I like that. I think it's... Uh, yeah. I mean, if, I, if he's going to be salty about stuff, okay, but like be salty about things that you that are like they should be adhering to. It, it's not fair to ask them to adhere to something that just came up. I do wonder like whether this did come up in conversation with between D and D and George was to whether they asked him whether like, hey, George, is it plausible that a dragon could fly north of the wall? Uh, <laughs> I would hope they would ask that question. Right? You you would imagine as much. And there's actually kind of an interesting backstory to it in that uh, I happen to be reading uh, a few old interviews with David Benioff and Dan Weiss. As you do. In, uh, as I do. In which they were asking, in which Deadline.com was asking uh, D&D about whether the Horn of Jormund would come into play. And uh, they both said, and it's not clear who said this, but they said, quote, we don't want to give away too much. There are the books and the show, and it would be a disservice to both if we went into too much detail of them. We're going to use, uh, and whether we're going to use too much detail of uh, either this or that, but we're not going to use that. So to me, it reads that in season seven, uh, the writing process behind that episode where they go north of the wall was intended to provide the others a pathway to bring the wall down to bring the wall down. It seems like that George has in mind something related to the horn of Jormund, but in the show, they decide to opt for something more cinematic and, and less magical ish being that the others get, or the white walkers get a, a dragon are able to bring the wall that way, bring the wall down that way at, in the final conclusion of season seven. Yeah, it does seem like it. I mean, in the show, it's their it's their workaround, um, rather than introduce a magic horn that brings down the wall. Which, granted, they didn't set up in the show. It would have been a bad idea um, to in suddenly in season seven have a magic horn. I guess. I mean, maybe someone wants to argue that, but um, I kind of feel like if if George is being salty here, he's being he's being kind of self salty, self deprecating a little mm. bit, in the sense that. Um, He's trying to set the record straight now. The w wins winner isn't out yet. He can't set it out, set the record straight that way. But he wants to make sure he gets these details out there that he has in his brain that other people don't know. And he's going, "Oh, right, yeah, I never clarified that." Like X, Y, Z. I need to get that out. I need to make sure that's that's understood in the fandom. Um, like it doesn't have to be him being salty at the show. I think I think I think it can just be him um, trying to find ways to get out information. That's not necessarily plot critical to Aswaf that he still wants to be common knowledge or to be known. Sure. And he may also be annoyed at the depiction of Asarion in particular as a White Walker dragon, which is basically what the show has said it is. His version of Ice Dragons, I mean, particularly from the short story Ice Dra the Ice Dragon, is very, very different. And it's much more elegant and less an undead horror kind of thing. And also it like it's not overpowered it's it doesn't it doesn't have like the ability to take down a wall like Viserion does in the show so perhaps he's also responding to that being like you guys are misunderstanding what dragons can and can't do or yeah 
I'm going to be real. I think that there will be some sort of undead dragon in the books. Because as of now, with three dragons, like, obviously that means that our quote-unquote good people side, good guys, the humans are OP. And there needs to be something, because the way that storytelling works is before things can get better, as the hero overcomes trials, like, things gotta get shit first. They gotta get real bad, right? Yeah. And so I do see the possibility of an undead dragon occurring in the books. I just think that it's not going to happen that same way. I think it's the dragon won't necessarily die on the other side of the wall, which I think George has made plainly clear. And if it is a possibility. I think that that, along with the wall, shows multiple reasons why the dragons would be reluctant to cross it. And that's my soapbox. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. <laughs> Everybody clap, Eliana. Good job. Thank yeah. you. Please clap. <laughs> Y'all, this is my third podcast this week. God dang. You are on fire yeah does that mean one of your podcasts is going to turn undead <gasps> is it not already <laughs> do i it's not feel undead already <laughs> <laughs> am i not undead um so the, the the dragon thing crossing the wall isn't the only um sort of show shade show shade in show shade. the show shade in this excerpt um there's also a mention of how alaric stark is so cheesed off at the idea that northerners are going to get married in a sept or that they would get married through like the right of the seven and he's like no we don't do that we get married in front of heart trees you know we get married in front of the weirwoods as, as the old gods intended um now in season two episode 10 of game of thrones anakin skywalker and padme amidala get married um in a faith of the seven ritual uh, or, you know, a Faith of the Seven ceremony. Basically the equivalent of, like, an Episcopalian ceremony. Um, <laughs> That's good. <laughs> I like the Episcopalian ceremonies. It's got all the good parts of the Catholic ceremony, but, like, abridged. Exactly. The Episcopalians are... Um, they're, they're a Catholic highlight reel, I think, is the way to describe them. Um, yeah. You as a Catholic <laughs> would say that. <laughs> <laughs> and welcome to Episcopalian Talk with Mr. Monthly. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Ecclesiastical Weekly with uh, the hosts of Maester Month. Um, yeah, so it, there's, I don't know, do you guys consider that shade or is that just like some character work that happens to overlap a little? That show? is shade. <laughs> that's a lot of shade. <laughs> that That's even more direct than the dragon thing, I would say, because like, like I said when I was responding to Jeff, like the explanation is like maybe Dan and Dave didn't know that. This would, this already happened we already know that the starks don't do that so oh sorry hit my mic we already know that's not a thing that the starks do so like i would say that's much more pointed and directed than the other one well it, it's not just that it's directed it's also that george has, a, has specifically addressed that he felt that the introduction of the character that abandoning jane westerling was so I think what's another word besides egregious it was so horrible i mean yeah it was it was <laughs> bad but uh, and and no offense to una chaplin who is a fantastic actress or actor and i have said in the past that i wish that una chaplin had played jane westerling but uh george had had even suggested that instead of having a, a, the character jane westerling with all sorts of different plot dressing and a, a backstory to suggest the character of Talisa as, as, as a substitute back when they were developing season two. And that's what they ended up going with here. And it does seem like that George was kind of like being like, uh, guys, like this, this, this isn't what would happen between Rob Stark and Talisa or Rob Stark and Jane Westerling. Cause Rob Stark is a true Northman. He would marry under a, under a heart tree. And to be fair to season two, you know, it is a marriage that's done with a, a septon and with like tying like the uh, the ribbon around each other's hands. But at the same time, it takes place in front of a heart tree. So it, it seems like it's kind of a syncretic union between the faith of the seven and the old gods. But I, I can see where that would kind of, as, as Michael said, would cheese 
George off because Robin to and Robin Jane Westerling were married in traditional Northman style in front of a heart tree and with the old gods in fuel in, in full view of what's going on there. Yeah, for sure. And I would say actually with the way Alaric says this, that Starks don't do that. This is like George, if this was a tweet, it would be like hashtag not my Rob or hashtag not my, not my Stark. He's like saying this, this is your Rob now. <laughs> this is, this is how I write Rob. I mean, is this is this a no true Northman fallacy here? Is this yes. uh Ooh, yes, are we falling question. into <laughs> falling into a trap? Hashtag um, <laughs> no true Mel Gibson. <laughs> I mean, Eddard Stark married Catelyn Tully in a at the Septa at the Septa River Run, and that's something that I recently found out doing some research. So, you know, you John go. Aaron and Lysa were married in a Sept, and then Ra and then Ned and Catelyn were married immediately afterwards in a Sept. So Yeah. I, I just don't feel, I mean, I, I see George's point, his kind of implied point, but at the same time, I also feel like that, I, I don't feel like it's entirely fair. I, and maybe that's, I mean, as much as I love this excerpt, I know we haven't gotten to like our actual opinions about this, but <laughs> I actually really love this excerpt. It's great. Yeah. That George might be being a little bit unfair to the writers of Game of Thrones in that he did show an example where there was this syncretic type marriage where Ned Stark, who is a true Northman, if you want to stay with the, like the no truth Northman <laughs> fantasy, marries Catelyn Tully in a sept at River Run, just as Robert's Rebellion is about to conclude at the Battle of the Trident. So two things. One, what if it isn't shade? <laughs> two. Yeah. Regarding Ned Stark, he was raised in the Vale of Erin, though, which is a very, I guess, Andalusian. Andalusian. But like, that's like a real. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's I think a very Andaly place that I could see him mm -hmm. being a little more willing to bend. But also, just throwing it out there that there are many people in the real world who might come from very staunchly ex-religion families, but like when you marry someone, sometimes they convert because sometimes that's what people do when they get married. That's George. right. George, come on. Ooh, I was going to say, do we fired. actually, do we know for sure that Rob and Jane did marry the, the, the old God style? In front I of a, do not know like, that. I, I genuinely don't know. This isn't like a gotcha type thing. I I don't fucking know. I'm gonna um, effort this. What's that? I'm gonna effort this. Okay. We'll get back Stop. to Jeff in about ten minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah. I mean. I. Yeah. I. I kind of feel similarly about like. I don't know. It, it didn't bother that part of the Talissa storyline didn't bother me as much in the show. Um. Marrying with a Septon. I mean, they also changed it so that Rhaegar and Lyanna got married in front of a Septon, um, or by the High Septon, which, frankly, I think is less likely than Rob getting married in a Sept, um, if I'm being honest, because it seems like, well, I mean, I'm of the opinion Rhaegar and Lyanna got married on the Isle of Faces and all that. Mm. And, like, you can't just be like, yo, Pope. Yeah, um, <laughs> if anyone's gonna like break up the you know marriage normalcy, it's not gonna be poems. Huh? Yeah, hey, yo, Francis, <laughs> I got a I got a marriage I want to know, and I also want to marry this new girl. <laughs> and the Pope's like, oh yeah, that's that's cool. I get it. These are two unrelated things, I'm sure. <laughs> He's not that progressive. That's right. He's not. Uh, this is this is now Ecclesiastical Weekly. With, uh, uh, we've finally done it. We're there. Yep, we've transitioned Jeff. into serious religion talk. Mainstream oh, monthly, we're like Septon Monthly. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Jeff, do you want to present your essay on Calvinism? We can wait. Yes, I would be happy to. Oh, so I'm sorry, Jeff. We have to move on to another part topic. Essay I'm on sorry, Calvinism. Jeff. I'm sorry. You could even call it the five-point <laughs> essay of Calvinism. We're we're moving a wow. on, on from this. It's we're good. moving on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so so quick quick thing. Um, so I can't find evidence that Rob and Jane buried in front of a heart tree, but it, Rob bids farewell to Jane from River Run in the Godswood. It says 
thrice during, in the gods, but in the sights of gods and men. So I, I guess it, it's not explicit in the text that they married in front of a heart tree and buried the old gods way, but the fact that they depart from each other in front of the, in, in front of the heart tree and three times perhaps indicates that they did marry in fact in front of a heart tree. But, yeah, sure. You know, sure. I guess that's actually a great question to ask George. You know, if, if 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 you want to put George to the question about this, like his next appearance, I think is at WorldCon in Dublin in 2019. Nice. Ask George whether Rob and Jane married the old God's way, or there was a kind of a syncretic Faith of the Seven and Old God's way that they married at. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I would be really curious to see what he says about it. Um, I think that could be a fun answer. But yeah, th so there was definitely some some reference to the show in this chapter. Um, Obviously, the show is not the only intellectual property in this uh, franchise. There's also a series of books, which is as yet unfinished. Um, and Fire this and book Blood has... Yes, right. Fi we're still waiting for Fire and Blood Volume 2. Um, ugh, come on, George. <laughs> Finish it up. Um, but there, So there's some fun connections to the main book series as well. Um, we already talked about the biggest one, I think, which is Alaric as Stannis. Am I right? <laughs> Am I right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's really what you think is the biggest one. Well, I, okay. I'm curious to hear what you think is the biggest one. Then, actually, I've seen a lot of people on Twitter saying that their biggest ones that they've seen are Alisan, Good Queen Alisan, and Sansa. Ah, yeah, you are yes. right. Uh, and then, con conversely, Jaehaerys and John. I've seen I have, that one a lot too. I have actually seen like people being like, ah, the artwork he posted of um Jaharis and Alisan for this chapter totally looks like John and Sansa. Which and it I, yeah, I it lines up. Sansa sure. is <laughs> becoming a very ad adept political manipulator, and John um ha has some learning to do, maybe from his uh from his half sister or his cousin. Cousin, yeah, cousin. Well, I, I look at John more as like kind of an egg on the third character and that egg on mm. the third is more of an archetype for him. But I'm curious what Eliana thinks are more of like the Sansa Alice Saint parallels that she's seeing in this excerpt. I'm sure other people have articulated them better. For example, my wife, Chloe, on right. the podcast Girls Gone Canon. Did you uh, guys get married in front of a godswood or um, <laughs> like in a sept? <laughs> It's an you know, inner it reference. Really it's an inner cool. episode reference. It's good. Yeah, it was a it was a shot. What, what was the term that she used before? Crossbow shot wedding. wedding. Yeah, crossbow wedding. <laughs> okay, oh, oh yeah, like a shot axe wedding. I think is uh, the reference that that Walda made when she came on <laughs> with like Arya Hota standing behind you. So we got married in front of Arya Hota, and. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot here, right? The way that she turns a situation, like for example, when Alaric Stark is, I don't know, fucking nagging her, and she's like, oh, <laughs> the place is so great. And she just <laughs> deals with everything with so much courtesy. You have her holding tourneys, for example, in that happens and is referenced in the world of ice and fire, but she's holding tourneys and in that way is able to bring small folk to the table like she does it in white harbor as well right where she holds a tourney and mm. brings small folk over and like wins wins them over she's just dealing with everything with utmost courtesy and i think that's what a lot of people see and of course there is the whole naming convention elaine Alison, mm. and mm. 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 wow mm. alisane sir uh, yeah alisane in the membrane <laughs> <laughs> yes nice yeah yeah so, i mean th i think there is a lot there because it's it's she and sansa wield that same kind of like what people might call soft power um where it's it's all to do with her interactions with other people and she's really good at interacting and alaric says stuff he's like he's always you know my wife wasn't a lady like you and like oh we don't have fancy balls and masquerades for ladies like you so she's clearly operating within the like set confines of what's normal for women in Westeros. You know, like she's she's operating in that sphere that Sansa operates in, um, and is really good at it. Yeah, is just excellent at it. Well, not to jump too far ahead of of what we're going to be talking about, but 
Is there a potential here if Alisane is the Sansa archetype and Alaric is the Stannis archetype in this excerpt mm -hmm. that we could see a potential Sansa Stannis interaction either in mm -hmm. the Winds of Winter or Dream of Spring? And that's something I have to admit is it, something that that Emmett, my podcast husband, had brought up. <laughs> On, on Twitter, so I'm, I feel like I'm kind of channeling him a little bit here, but yeah. it's really fascinating to me because it's something I've never considered of having a Stannis Sansa interaction in the future of the story and how that would go down. But we have two great archetypes here in the forms of Alisane and Alaric, and does that give us a vision of what we're going to see if Stannis is holding Winterfell after he defeats the Boltons and Sansa and the Knights of the Vale come up? to Winterfell and to the north in the winds of winter. Are we seeing what's going to happen come, you know, that event and later in the story? And that's how I know you haven't been paying attention to my lemon poppy, spelled P-A-P-I, <laughs> shit. <laughs> the oh my God. Sand shit. Yes. Yes. Uh, I thought this was my shit. Me and Jeff just sighed in agreement. This was amazing. <laughs> no, I, know. I think you and I have talked about this multiple times on Twitter. The, the lemon, yes. hashtag lemon poppy. I'm going to look also it up. Expanded, we've also expanded it to be a love triangle, right? Where John and Sansa are both vying for Stannis' affections because I thrive. You think darkness <laughs> is your ally. I was born in it. Wow. Yes. That's amazing. That's just, my contribution to this podcast. I also want to point out the bravery of Jeff proposing that his favorite character would start smooching with his least favorite character. I don't say smooching. Oh, they're going to use that. That, I, that was the subtext. He's going to take her to see some giant bones. Well, okay. you, you know, one of the things <laughs> that's brought up in the Elaine sample chapter from The Winds of Winter is that Littlefinger. And, and, and I'm, I'm taking this this terminology from from Jim, from uh, otherwise known as something like a lawyer, a, a redditor, and also one of my uh, compatriots on the Wars and Politics Voice and Fire podcast. In that, Elaine or Sansa are is basically doing. Littlefinger is utilizing Sansa in terms of like kind of soft pimping Sansa in order to like lure Harry the heir in order to lure him into some sort of either betrothal pact or marriage pact, something like that. And you could see a sense where Littlefinger might be telling Sansa in the Winds of Winter, well, Sansa holds Winterfell, charm him, lure him in, bring him into your confidence. And then from there, we'll be able to take the North and be able to win his knights over to our service. So I can see that being a very strong possibility in the Winds Winter. And really, it, it's really exciting because it's something I really never, ever considered between Sansa and Stannis in, in the Winds of Winter. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, I, I, I go back and forth on it. Um, cause I, I agree. I, like check out Emmett's thread on this topic and, and, you know, the idea that these two will interact. I also wonder if it's not an example of George um, using this world book as an excuse to mix and match characters who won't meet, you know, like is uh, taking these archetypes and playing with them in a different way. Basically like if, if Aswaf is him playing with a bunch of dolls, right. Then the world book is him taking these same dolls and like rearranging them and being like, Oh, well what if this one got to talk to this one? Or turtles. So, I was or turtles. Say, yeah, turtles. That's yes. it's turtles. Which is how he actually writes uh, his books. Yeah. Um, he leaves turtles to crawl around on a keyboard and then he edits what they write. Um, no, but so I, I, I kind of go back and forth on that with this Stannis Sansa thing because I, I agree. They're very much parallels. Um, and I just don't know if it's an example of something we are going to see in Aswaf or something that we won't see in Aswaf so he gets to play around with it here not in the main series. Um, and I mean, I, we're talking about this specifically with this excerpt, but I think I, that goes for any of these sort of world book things where we see parallels. Um, like, is it is it going to happen the same way or is it an alternate version of what will happen? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't know. I feel strongly the more I read The World of Ice and Fire and the more I see, you know, this excerpt, that George is attempting to set the historical foundation in place for events that'll come down 
in the wins of winter. So I, I don't know. I, I feel like I feel like the Stannis Sansa thing is a is a real possibility come the wins of winter. I don't know whether I, I don't know whether the interaction will be the same here or, or rather the same as we're going to see, but I, I, I did feel that George after writing a dance with dragons felt like he needed to sit down and set some of the store, the future story up through the, through the history. Because one of the things he says in Feast for Crows is that wheel is a time, you know, perforce what things have happened in the past will happen once again. So having Sansa and Stance interact in the same way that Alaric and, and, and Alice interact, it seems like something that would play out potentially in the winter. Yeah. Yeah. I can see it. I can see it. I don't know. Do you guys think there's anything else for the Winds of Winter in here besides like the Alaric, Stansa, Stannis, Alisan quadrangle? I'm sure there is. I, I can't think of any. That's fair. <laughs> I think like part of the Winds of Winter. Like for sure we get some Tourney of Hall vibes with... Oh. This wildling girl, which of course hints towards the Night of the Laughing Tree, being Liana, which of course hints towards Rhaegar and Liana. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Been confirmed by the TV show. And <laughs> that's something that I think is going on. I just am not sure what constitutes as Winds of Winter vibes. Yeah, that's fair. I'll, I'll, I'll give you one. There is a mention of a character named Jeanquo in this chapter. And Jeanquo is a female name in Westeros, and she is known as a sworn shield of Alisane. And I wonder whether some events that we see in season seven of Game of Thrones, where Brienne of Tarth becomes essentially Sansa Stark's sworn shield, is something that we're going to see in the Winds of Winter, whether Brienne of Tarth will become you know, a sworn sh an actual sworn sheet of uh, of Sansa, as as again we see in se in season seven of Game of Thrones. Whether that's something that George has in mind, I think it's 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 clear to me that that Jeanquo and um, and Alysanne's relationship is much more in depth than what we see here in this little excerpt. I'd be curious to see because one of the things that that that's that becomes clear from this chapter is that, or from this text rather, is that it takes place kind of in the middle of seemingly a larger chapter. So you do wonder whether the introduction of Jean Quo and Alisane occurs towards the beginning of this chapter, and you know, it, it would be cool if we have this idea of a female sworn shield of uh, of Alisane then become the historical foundation for Brienne becoming, you know, Sansa's sworn shield. I think it's a cool idea to keep in mind. Yeah, that this makes sense. Winds of winter, but just a thing in general that House Dark, I think, has a tendency to have some allegiances with some of the women in the Targaryen family. Like, for example, Jean Gual Dark, House Dark isn't distant kin of House Darkland. And there's a Herald Dark who was, I think, amongst the Kingsguard or like a sworn shield or something of Rhaenyra during the dance. So it's just fun. And and obviously there's, you know, kind of an, another connection with Sansa there because um, Dantos Hollard and the Darklands, like the Hollards and the Darklands were connected. And Dantos is the Florian to Sansa's Jonquil. So there's this whole weird you know, red string connection between these characters where you have Sworn Shields, Jonquil, Florian, Archetype, Darklin, Hollard, Dark, like like all these kind of mishmash of things that connect to each other. Yeah, it's classic George writing a bunch of names on turtles and letting them run around and then deciding this time this is how they line themselves up. Now, I would like to point out another reference that I think may have gone completely over people's heads, but um, uh, Jonquil Dark is also called the Scarlet Shadow. And people might not know this, but the Scarlet Shadow is actually a bowling ball. I thought it was my period, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's a much better joke than the bowling ball one. 
It's yeah, a pretty you, good one. For the record, if you Google Scarlet Shadow, uh, the bowling ball is the first thing to come up. <laughs> 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 All right. Uh, I kind of had one more thing I, did, I sort of wanted to talk about. Yeah, sure. And, and it was something that I brought up on Twitter where um, Jaharis has the nickname the conciliator. That's what he's known for. He mm. he solved the problem with the faith militants Targaryens that Magor left behind. But what we're seeing here is a, an incredible display of Alysanne's ability as a conciliator, her political abilities, her ability to bring people together that are not happy with her, people that have reason to have to have conflict, like the Starks after losing their kingship. And like Jeff was saying, maybe they were thinking about some kind of rebellion or maybe the Night's Watch was too, because the Lord Stark had to tell them to like, hey, cool it guys. So he probably thought there was going to be problems if she went up there. But then at the on the flip side of the story, which is again mostly about Alisane, you have Jaharis, who is not doing such a hot job being a conciliator himself. He his attempt at bringing together the um, the Pentashi and the Tairashi. Oh, that's that's a that's a tongue twister. Pentashi mm. Tairashi. <laughs> um, you, know, you know they're they're fighting in the streets. They're not really getting anywhere, and it sort of implies that perhaps. Jerry's conciliator title and his reputation are perhaps a little bit founded more on Alisane's abilities and him relying on her than the other way around that got lost to time. Can you enlighten us again, Matt, on what, what did happen to the poor fellows and the warrior's sons? What happened to the faith militant in general? What happened to the poor fellows and the faith militant? They were outlawed by Magor the Cruel. He killed a bunch of them. He put a golden dragon out for a warrior's son's skull. I think it was a silver stag for a poor fellow's skull. Mm -hmm. Mask killed them. And then um, Jaharius' real, his big thing, the, probably the thing that the reason that the Tairashi and the Pentashi came to him is they probably heard about his ability to solve this great schism in the king in a kingdom. <laughs> That's probably why they were like, this guy, he'll be able to solve it. Like a King Solomon figure. Yeah, and specifically like um, it was Septon Barth that also helped negotiate the yes. the uh, truce, basically. Um, I mean, Jaharis was actually crowned by a, the High Septon, so there was already sort of this conciliation beginning. But the ultimate reconciliation of it was when um, basically the Faith had, at one point, the authority to hold their own trials and basically run their own uh, deep state. You know, like like they had their <laughs> own religious state, um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, they they had their own court system. They had their own uh, legal system set up, like the Vatican, at, like yeah, the Vatican, exactly like the Vatican. Yeah. Um. Once again, it's ecclesiastical talk, and we haven't even talked about the sacrament of reconciliation, which Jaharis probably could have worked on. But <laughs> anyway, um, no. So Septon Barth does negotiate this, where no, the faith no longer has that independent authority. Everything has to go through the crown. And we learn in this chapter that a lot of the Black Brothers up at the Wall are former poor fellows and warriors' sons, the two militant orders within the Faith Militant. Um, which suggests, to me anyway, that part of the deal, uh, like the disarmament basically of the Faith, was um, that rather than these people be disciplined or go through some sort of Faith-related court system, that they were going to be shipped up to the Seven Kingdoms Penal Colony up in the north. So all these these poor fellows and warriors' sons who had been sent to the wall, specifically. Um, and the rest of the church infrastructure oh. kind of remains intact, but these sort of militant elements all got banished, all got turned into Night's Watchmen. That's right. And I think the, the deal that was made is, you go to the wall, we'll never Magor the Cruel you again. Like, that's mm -hmm. off the table. Mm -hmm. What Magor did to you will never happen again. The Targaryens will never go there. And in exchange, you guys get to keep your lives, get to go to the, get to go to the wall. Your families don't probably don't lose their lands for your rebellion. So, yeah, because I mean, the warriors' sons' order was landed knights, basically, right. and like you know, the, the, uh, second sons and things like that, basically adventure-seeking noblemen. Um, so, yeah, you can see why there might be this sort of middle-class incentive to protect their interests and be like, no, 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 we're not going to have all these people killed off. We're not going to be, you know, exiled or excommunicated. We'll just send these guys to the wall and that'll take care of it. That's my read on it anyway. 
it, it's a good read, and I think it also speaks to how popular the faith militant uprising is, is because in this excerpt, they t it talks about how the the Lord Commander selected 800 of the best Night's Watchmen to uh. meet up with Alisane. So if it's 800 of the best, is that like 10%? Is that 25%? Yeah. You have to wonder, right? So the fact that you have all of, you have the, the the ranks of the Night's Watch swelled by all these folks that are being sent to the wall as opposed to being executed or returning to the King's Peace speaks to how popular that rebellion actually was. And, you know, as we talked about before, I think that is going to have an implication for the Winds of Winter and that it does show us how, you know, how much of a groundswell of support the High Septon in, in the form of the High Sparrow has in, you know, gaining the gaining popularity in terms of taking both the small folk and the in the uh, the poor fellows, as well as taking nobility in in the warrior sons. And you know, in the Feast for Crows, it's talked about how there are several hundred knights that have now sworn their swords to the High Sparrow. And the fact that they've sworn their source to the High Sparrow leads us to believe that it is a genuine popular upswell of support is in relation to what happened at the War of the Five Kings. It almost, uh, I didn't think this until right now, so it's a half-formed thought, but it almost makes me wonder if some of that resurgence of the Faith Militant will once again be channeled towards the wall. If we're going to see whoever comes into power and happens to be able to do this. I don't know if it's even plausible because like I said, this is a very half formed thought, but sending the warrior sons and, and um, you know, return faith militant, poor fellows yeah. um, up to the wall in like the winds of winter or in, in a dream of spring. And maybe that that could be a synergy. It doesn't even have to be a, a penal thing like this. It could just be something where the high sparrow, um, you know, agrees to work for the betterment of mankind or something. I don't know. Um, but that's, that's one interesting avenue for where that newly armed mass movement could go um, is North. Yeah. I also, I also efforted the question Jeff had at the time of Aegon the Conqueror, the Night's Watch had 10,000 swords. So we're about a hundred years later, more like 70 or 80. So eight, less. less. We're much less. By, this, this takes place in 55 AC. Okay, so 55 years, 800 men, that's probably about right. So 800, if that's his best, like 10%, then they probably have like eight, 9,000 guys at that time. Yeah, that's probably right. If not more, because there might have been a sudden upswing of like 5,000 um, peasants who got sent to the wall. Um, so yeah, well, this could be anywhere from like 10 to 5%. You have to imagine that when Aegon conquered Westeros, that those who were unwilling to bend the knee to Aegon were sent to the wall. So having 10,000 dudes there would be fine for the moment. But in 55 years since Aegon actually landed in what's known as King's Landing now, having those numbers fall down and then be mm -hmm. kind of built back up with people being sent to the wall kind of kind of makes sense, right? If it's like yeah. 8,000 men at the time of Jaharas and, and Alisane, mm -hmm. you know, Bye. it makes total sense. Go ahead, Elia. I was going to say, but at the same time, J Aegon comes in. If there's 10,000 men at the wall during his reign, some of those, as you said, might have been the result of opponents that Aegon showed amnesty to. And Jaehaerys and Alysanne, I don't think it can be forgotten, are coming again like at the end of what was kind of like a war or a low-key war after. Like, people were rallying behind Magor until, you know, God knows what happens to Magor. But there's mm -hmm. a possibility that there were still people who were supporting that rule and standing against him that would have had to be sent to the wall. And just to clarify, the 10,000 that we're talking about, um, this was 10,000 when Aegon invaded. Yeah, when, when Heron Hall was burned. Right. The story is, is a reference because Heron Hor's brother was Lord Commander. He yes. held back his 10,000 swords when his brother died and right. all of his sons. Right. That just makes me think the number would have grown if 
the Night's Watch back then was still used as a penal colony. Like, we mm -hmm. see that the Night's mm -hmm. Watch's function has evolved in function because they can no longer get people to enlist and staff the wall. So, of course, it kind of is, and we can see that here because the poor fellows and the warrior sons were sent there, but that's not its sole function. True. And there, there's actually almost a downside to Alisane and Jaehaerys' amazing abilities throughout their reign is that a lot of the people that ended up on the wall ended there because of minor conflicts between kingdoms. You know, men were given the option to go to the wall or the noose or the axe, I think that was the saying. And with long terms of peace in Targaryen dynasties, particularly during Jaehaerys and Alisane, there's nobody being sent to the wall from wars anymore or skirmishes or very, very few. The warrior sons and the poor fellows might have been like the last infusion for quite a long time until the dance of the dragons well I, this excerpt as we said earlier it was extremely long it was only you know it was over a thousand words um but i feel like we've we've done it pretty good justice so let's end with just what are your overall reaction what was your overall reaction to this excerpt jeff why don't we start with you i really liked it i i, I feel that I was a little miffed when George announced Fire and Blood Volume 1 back a year ago because I was like, well, yet another distraction for the Winds of Winter. Great. Fantastic. And and while I like the World of Ice and Fire, I can't say that I was like, oh my god, I can't wait to find out who was the son of Jaehaerys' brother and the <laughs> cousin of that son of Jaehaerys' the brother. Like, family trees don't do fucking shit for me as a as a feature of storytelling <laughs> but here i think we get george doing fantastic work we can see george interacting and and still writing some great dialogue and great scenes and really writing some you know for lack of a better term the the heart and conflict with itself so i'm impressed by george's production of this excerpt and the fact that he wrote it probably within within the past year leads me to think that you know all those folks who are saying like, well, George is like just doesn't care about a song of ice and fire more. He's lost interest. He just doesn't. He <laughs> hates it. He's he's just not like his heart isn't into it anymore. Like fuck those people mm. because this chapter and this excerpt more than anything else shows us that George actually still cares about a song of ice and fire. Still cares about Westeros. And anyone who thinks differently can go jump down a long, long well. <laughs> nice. Yeah, okay. The well in the night fort. That's where all of the people go. Who <laughs> I think he's done with Aswaf. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Matt, what about you? Uh, I would agree with Jeff in that I was not super excited about Fire and Blood. I enjoyed Sons of the Dragon for different reasons but not really like narrative reading i enjoyed what it told us about visenya and the relationship of the targaryen women versus the kings and how they they seem to be playing much a much stronger role than you would think based on the histories but it was kind of it was kind of like a boring story this was even this small bit felt like classic germ where he's doing a lot of world building he's doing it elegantly he's doing it quickly and he's telling complex stories that 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 the more you keep digging into it like we did during this podcast we kept finding things to talk about and that's the i think that's the sign that he is plugged into an idea like a lot of his stories that are not that good are ones that are very flat this is not a flat one this is a very deep one if the rest of fire and blood is like this i mean i was on the fence if i was going to buy it. i'm going to buy it now if it's anything like this it probably will be like this given that this is an excerpt from it yeah, I think that's a safe assumption. Well, it also has um, Sons of the Dragon in it, so I... It does. <laughs> that's true. Sons of the Durgan. Yeah, Cerns of the Durgan. Yeah, um, that's, that's my opinion. Eliana, can you pronounce Cerns of the Durgan for us and also tell us what you thought? Cerns of the Durgan! <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that's so good. That's so good. So yeah, what was your, what was your opinion then, Eliana? I have so many thoughts. I was... I, I love what Matt said. First of all, I'm going to so, go lend some credence to what he said about like, yes, this is some classic germ. Like in 1000 words, 
Gurm is doing a lot. He probably hates what we call him Gurm. He's doing a lot in here. And the one thing that has been keeping me afloat when it comes to Fire and Blood, which secretly, yes, I haven't pre-ordered it yet either, but I obviously I'm going to because same. this is my life. Like, guys, like, A Song of Ice and Fire, I guess, is my life now, I suppose. What has been keeping me afloat with Fire and Blood and something that came to me as we were reading Sons of the Dragon last year is that the story of Aegon the First through Aegon the Third, or to Aegon the Third, is the story of how women are losing political power in Westeros. And I think that is absolutely bolstered by this excerpt, which isn't about Jaehaerys, right? It's showing the pro political prowess that Alysanne uses and how that is so important to binding the realm. And I think it's absolutely something that's inherited from her mother or learned from her mother, Alyssa, who was crucial to bringing Magor down after Magor like fucked everything up. And we see like all these Targaryen women being actual political actors and how that falls apart after the dance and how that slowly gets chipped away by things like the Great Council, et cetera. And that's something that I love that this chapter digs into. I know there's a lot of things about the lore and the wall, but that's something that really interests me because what interests me about A Song of Ice and Fire is the very human stories behind it. Totally. I mean, I think that's a great way to sum it up, especially like you said, like it, we're not just getting uh, a very by the numbers, like here's what happened, here's what happened. We're, it does feel like we're getting more of the sort of secret history, <laughs> the history behind the history of the Targaryens and an element of that being like the diminishing power of women in the Targaryen dynasty and how all that happens. And we get to see that play out instead of just getting sort of the bullet points of, and then Alisanne flew north and did this, 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 and this. Um, I I very much like this excerpt. It kind of made me wish that Fire and Blood was coming out as a series of blog posts over the course of a, like a year instead of in a book. Because my fear with Fire and Blood is that there's going to be a lot of interesting stuff in there, but nobody's going to care enough to dig this deeply into it as we do with like little excerpts from it. Because um, when you can think about it in these sort of bite-sized chunks, it's a little easier to to grab onto. I don't know. Maybe that's that's a, a worry that will be alleviated over time as we have more time to sink into it. But um, I don't know. Fire. It, it. I think this was the perfect way to experience this like excerpt, this content. It wasn't too much. It was a nice little quick narrative, um, and it was interesting. It was very interesting. There was definitely some of the classic Aswaf in there which we know and love so well. I think that's true. And even what Eliana said, uh, among the four of us on this podcast right now, we have very often very different things we enjoy about A Song of Ice and Fire, and we all pulled things out of this short expert excerpt that we're really interested in, and we all went off on our own little ways. And that's perfect, A Song of Ice and Fire writing. That's kind of what the fandom is. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. The, the real fandom is the friends we made along the way. <laughs> yeah, I know. Am I right? It really is. It's so beautiful what you said, Matt. Really, thank, thank you, Eliana. Take my oh. breath away, <laughs> Matt oh. magician. Jeff, by the way, I wanted to ask you before this ended. Do you want to do a Top Gun rewatch series? We'll just watch like ten minutes at a time. <laughs> sure, man. Yeah, uh, let's do it. <laughs> I'm in. Not a Top, a top Gun. gun. How about, yeah. Not a gun. <laughs> People not are a, very confused about what that podcast is. Podcast. Not a gun. Uh, podcast. Guess. Well, I think that wraps it up for our quickie episode on the excerpt, uh, the Queen Alisanne excerpt from Fire and Blood. Um, so, as always, you can find Maester Monthly and our Quill and Tankard episodes on iTunes, on Google Play, on Stitcher, on Acast, and on YouTube. Um, you can also find us on social media, on Facebook and on Twitter at Maester Monthly, where, as always, you are permitted by the grace of the gods to smash that that like button. Smash the like button. <laughs> I decided to back off of the hostility there a little bit. Um, can't you say smash that motherfucking life like button at this point? Because you I can't. can't. Personally I, can. Now. I just, you know, I, I don't want it to wear out too much. You know, I don't want to don't want to 
uh, it overstay its welcome a little bit. So how about instead of smash that MF and like button this time, um, search for my tweet in which I role play Stannis and Sansa about to get into it and like that instead. Smash the MF and like button on that one. Um in which Stannis says, I already have one red woman, said Stannis, teeth grindingly. Now you have two. <laughs> 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 so um, anyway, that's uh, that's my shout out. Yeah, um, but I have been Michael, also known as Bookshelf Stud. And I have been Eliana, also known as Glass Table Girl. And to echo Michael's sentiments, A, look that up, B, the hashtag is Lemon Poppy, P-A-P-I. But he has another one that is also lemon. I don't know what that was yet. There was lemon a, storm. The, lemon storm. Lemon storm. Hashtag lemon storm. Hashtag lemon poppy. Hashtag lemon storm. These are the hashtags that you need. <laughs> okay. Uh, I've been Matt, also known as Joe Magician. And make sure you check out Michael's other favorite hashtag. Hashtag lemon party. It's a good one. <laughs> Just, uh, yeah, don't. Don't, don't do that. that. <laughs> <laughs> he tweets about it all the time. <laughs> and I've been Jeff, otherwise known as Brennan Beefish. And thanks so much, you guys, for having me on as a guest. And I've had a lot of fun talking about the Slovak sword. You're not a guest. <laughs> Hashtag, Hashtag not a guest. Hashtag not a guest. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> Thank it. you guys so much for listening. And you will hear from us next time. End the broadcast. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>